Hey there, everybody, and welcome to this video on the changes to the DSM-5 TR, or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders 5, text revised. I'm your host, Dr. Donnelly Snipes. In this presentation, I'm going to briefly review the changes to the DSM-5 TR. So I know a lot of you that are watching this may not be clinicians. So this video really may not interest you, um, or it's not going to go deep into diagnosis. We're really just talking about changes that were made in the diagnostic and statistical manual in this first hour of the series on the changes in the DSM-5 TR. So the understanding of mental disorders continues to advance. Since it's been nine years since the DSM-5 was released, most disorders have had at least some revisions with the majority having significant revisions. Now, as you'll learn in a few minutes, those significant revisions did not come in the text area where the diagnostic criteria are. The sections that were most extensively updated were the sections on prevalence, risk and prognostic factors, culture-related diagnostic issues, sex and gender-related diagnostic issues, association with suicidal thoughts or behavior, and comorbidity. Now, the section on association with suicidal thoughts and behavior, or behavior, that is an entirely new section, and that is actually a pretty helpful section. Obviously, when you're working with people, you are going to be regularly assessing them for their level of suicidality or homicidality, but it's nice to just have this section in there to remind us that certain disorders are associated with a um, higher level of suicidal ideation or suicide attempts. Uh, there is the section on comorbidity that in some cases touches on uh, neuropsychological issues. But a lot of times in for the different diagnoses, it's still very vague and it's kind of general medical disorders, but they don't really talk a lot about what could those general medical disorders be. And I'm going to harp on that, but we'll get there. The prevalence data was updated. Now, remember this text, it appears was finalized uh, in 2016 and then it went through the review process and everything after that. So the data that we're getting in here is from 2016. Now I want you to think about what's happened between 2016 and now. A lot of crap has happened. So the prevalence rates are likely for a lot of disorders are likely going to be higher. That being said, just bear that in mind. Prevalence doesn't really make that much of a difference in diagnosis. If somebody meets the criteria, they meet the criteria, whether it is 1% of the population or 21% of the population doesn't really matter. It just gives you an idea maybe when you're educating them about the disorder, about how prevalent it is. Risk and prognostic factors helps you when you do your clinical assessment. You can look back and see that um, Sammy had these risk factors for this disorder. So that's supporting information for your diagnosis. Um, just because somebody has a risk factor does not mean they are going to develop the disorder. So you're not using risk factors as diagnostic tools, but they are adding support to your understanding and adding support to your diagnosis. Sex and gender related diagnostic issues. Uh, we'll talk about this more in, in a few minutes. They do talk in many disorders about the differences in diagnostic rates between the two biological genders, as well as difference in presentation, in symptom presentation that is often seen between the biological genders. Uh, but we'll talk about how that might be a little quirky in a minute. And then comorbidity, I already talked about. So there are there's a lot of information in there. And if you are really wanting to understand a particular diagnosis, like ADHD or um, 
autism spectrum disorders or schizophrenia or whatever. This gives you a pretty succinct synopsis of what might be going on and things for further research. This does not tell you the DSM-5, TR, nor any of the earlier versions tell you everything there is to know about XYZ diagnosis. It tells you these are the characteristics and these are some things that we know are associated with it. And if you're treating somebody with this, you may want to take this into consideration and do further research. In terms of organization, the DSM-5-TR is still arranged in recognition of the underlying vulnerabilities and symptom characteristics across the lifespan. So where you found it in the DSM-5 is going to be in the same place in the DSM-5-TR. So for people like me who really get used to, you know, do I open in the front, the middle, or the back of the book to try to find this, um, it's still going to be in the same place. Of course, you can also buy the tabs that you put on so you can easily see each section, but I've always just been too lazy to do that. The changes comprised in the DSM-5 TR, unfortunately, date back to 2016. So it appears that new research in the field of neurobiology, the impact of the microbiome, etc., is not included. In graduate school, a general rule that I was taught was that seven-year-old research is considered out of date. Now, cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, doesn't change. However, um, the people with whom we are using CBT does change. Um, our understanding of the causes of things like depression and um, autism spectrum disorders and stuff also evolves very, very rapidly. So information that is in the DSM-5 may not be inclusive of all of our uh, current knowledge. So it's really important to be willing to go to PubMed or somewhere else and do some research so you understand all of the potential causative factors um, and recommended treatments for the disorders that you're teaching. Another big change, the ICD-10 CM codes are now used. They're not using the uh, DSM codes and the ICD-10. So they've just adopted the ICD-10 codes, which is going to be uh, a learning curve for a lot of people who are used to only using the DSM codes. And some of the ICD-10 codes changed since the DSM-5 was originally released. So it's still in the DSM, uh, in the ICD-10, but the, uh, some of the, some of the numbers, um, are, are different. So it's important to not assume, you know, what code you're supposed to use. It's important to look it up. You can also go to the ICD website and look it up there. Now, another little caveat. The World Health Organization formally adopted the ICD-11 in May of 2019, and it was to be effective beginning January 1st of 2002. So the DSM-5-TR is just now coming out and is using the DS is using the ICD-10 codes. Way too many acronyms here. Um, however the rest of the world is already starting to segue over to ICD-11. It'll be really important to check with your insurance provider or insurance uh, payors to figure out which version of the ICD code they want, whether it's 10 or 11. There was no information I could find about when the grace period would be over and there would be forced adoption of the ICD-11. So to summarize, since I tripped over my tongue a couple of times, uh, the codes we used to use in the DSM, like 295.40, are now no longer there. The only thing that we have is the ICD-10 codes, and that's what you're going to use um, to denote the particular diagnosis. So let's talk about some more of the updates. A lot of the updates were what I will call semantic. Um, autism spectrum disorders. 
the person must meet all three criteria for criterion a it used to say the person must meet the following criteria now they have the word all in there to emphasize that the person needs to meet all three criteria disruptive mood dysregulation disorder now this is one of the few where the diagnostic criteria actually did change the appropriate age range used to be um, up to 12 years of age and now in the dsm-5 tr the appropriate age range is now 6 to 18. so disruptive mood dysregulation disorder can be diagnosed all the way up through the 18th birthday ptsd for the child now this is another one of those semantic ones because they felt like the wording was redundant so they eliminated the phrase for children six years or less witnessing cannot include through media such as television or movies and must be witnessed in person so that's just a redundancy that was removed um, why am I telling you because it's in the summary of DSM changes and I will link to in the classroom uh, if you're taking this as a class I will link to the DSM changes um, document and if you're just watching it as a movie or as a movie gosh as a video I will put a link in the video notes to the PDF from the APA that summarizes the changes in the DSM-5 TR PTSD um, exposure through electronic media still does not count unless work related so that's not a change I just did want to highlight that because it's a mistake I see commonly uh, in clinicians where uh, the news and things like that that people watch that are not work related are traumatizing to people and they are counting that um, in the diagnosis of PTSD and unfortunately currently according to the DSM you can't do that brief psychotic disorder postpartum was changed to peripartum which includes the last month of pregnancy and this was also changed to be consistent with the major depressive disorder specifiers because the MDD always had or recently in the DSM-5 had peripartum now my issues with this it only refers to women men do get postpartum depression too there's research on it and I am I have hyperlinked to but one of many studies additionally according to the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology you'd think they would know uh, postpartum depression can occur up to one year after birth but the DSM still says that we're diagnosing it the, the month prior to birth and the four weeks after birth uh, so there's a big disconnect there and I bring that up because even though the DSM says you know the, we have this eight week window here I think it's important for us as clinicians to be aware of the fact that uh, the medical community sees it as much farther than that and I don't want us to potentially not screen for or notice postpartum depression if it's occurring uh, major depressive episode with mixed features nearly every day is stricken leaving during the majority of days um, it used to say nearly every day during the majority of days which obviously was redundant so they just took out that redundancy bipolar disorder now you may think this makes a difference in diagnostic criteria you may not however it is what it is the phrase goal directed was eliminated from manic episode it used to talk about an increase in goal directed behavior now it just talks about an increase in behavior additionally wording of severity specifiers for manic episodes was changed now you may think it's similar enough to the old way that you don't see a big difference I think this simplifies it a lot for people when they're trying to figure out what 
uh, severity level to apply to the to the diagnosis so mild minimum criteria are met moderate the person is exhibiting significant increases in activity or impaired judgment during the episode so with mild they're just barely kind of meeting those criteria you're thinking is this a significant increase in energy yeah they're they've got a little bit more going on moderate there's a significant increase and and it's obvious severe nearly continual supervision is needed on a daily basis to prevent prevent the person from harming themselves or others so obviously severe is pretty clear uh, in the specifier bipolar 2 now remember with bipolar two, with bipolar one it's the person has to have had a full-blown manic episode bipolar two the person has to have had a full-blown depressive episode but they never have a ma full-blown manic episode they're hypomanic bipolar two uh specifiers have been changed now it includes anxious distress mixed features peripartum onset remember four weeks before four weeks after uh, so those describe different things and you can have a lot of these somebody with bipolar disorder can have anxious distress it can have an onset peripartum um, and it can be rapid cycling so you want to make sure to identify all of the specifiers necessary in order to paint a thorough clinical picture seasonal is also on there and that describes a a pattern and the seasonal we'll talk about later is not due to seasonal stressors like grief that's triggered um, seasonal is often um, triggered we see the seasonal pattern as a result of um, circadian changes often bipolar 2 depression they have added a whole lot of specifiers for depression we have anxious distress um, depression with that has melancholic features depression with atypical features now they don't explain these very much either um, and and they never have they have mood congruent or mood congru that mood incongruent psychotic features mixed features catatonia peripartum onset rapid cycling or seasonal they do note in the dsm-5 tr changes that the seasonal pattern specifier now applies to all mood episodes not just depression so when we're looking at uh, specificity we used to think of seasonal affective disorder and think depression and think okay that's the only thing that's seasonal but they found that uh, mania and hypomania can also have seasonal aspects to them so seasonal is included as a specifier for both poles uh, that the person experiences the specifier does not apply to mood episodes the seasonal specifier does not apply to mood episodes linked to seasonal psychosocial stressors like seasonal unemployment holiday grief you know triggering memories of a loss that they've had um, something that may come up during that time major depressive episodes are often characterized by a prominent loss of energy hypersomnia overeating weight gain and carbohydrate cra craving in the dsm-5 they forgot typo uh, to put loss of energy so in the dsm-5 it says by a by a prominent energy um, and instead of prominent loss of energy so that's what's added there but i think clinical judgment would have led you as it led me i didn't even realize there was a typo because i just read over it um seeing that loss of was there because that's what i expected severity specifiers are only refer to major depressive episodes not hypomanic episodes so when you're doing your diagnosis you've got all these 
specifiers, but then there's also a section for severity and it's referring to the depressive episode that the per person's experiencing. Depressive disorders with a seasonal pattern. Now, this is, we're not talking about bipolar anymore, um, but depression, hypomania, both have this seasonal specifier. Um, depressive disorders with seasonal pattern um, also had that same typo where they didn't have the phrase loss of before energy. Hypomanic. The episode is not attributable to the physiological effects of a substance. As you... That was where it stopped in the DSM-5. In the DSM-5-TR, they added, or another medical condition. Uh, so we want to make sure, and it is emphasizing the fact, that there are biological, physiological issues that can cause a lot of these symptoms um, and cause things that mimic the disorder. And no matter how much talk therapy you do, Unless the underlying medical condition is also addressed, there's a cap on the gains that the person can probably uh, expect to achieve. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder. This is in the section three in the new formulation of personality disorders. Conscientiousness is the opposite pole of disinhibition. So we're striking the word detachment. They had, um, in the DSM-5, they had conscientiousness is the opposite pole of detachment, and that was wrong. They have it as disinhibition. Section three, this is where we have the emerging measures and models. And if you remember in the DSM-5, and I don't know if you even knew, uh, so if you don't, Here's some news. If you go to the APA website, and I have it linked here in the PowerPoint, uh, they have the level one and level two cross-cutting measures that you can download. In graduate school, you learned about a lot of different psychometric assessments that you could use, and you had to memorize them for the NCMHCE and all that kind of stuff. But in reality, we almost never use them in clinical practice. Some of them are expensive, uh, others of them seem redundant. Uh, there are a lot of reasons agencies don't decide to use a lot of the psychometric assessments. But suffice it to say uh, that a lot of them don't get used. If you go to the DSM website, the, from the uh, American Psychiatric Association's DSM website, the level one and level two cross-cutting measures are really useful. Level one is very general. It says these are your general symptoms. Um, and based on how the person answers, then there's a follow-on level two measure in order to drill down to try to figure out more specifically what might be going on with the person. So it helps you narrow the field some so you're not looking at the DSM, which is now over a thousand pages, and going, ah, where do I even start? So it can be very helpful. Those um, uh, cross-cutting measures are free to download, to use, so that's great. Uh, they did, on those, delete the male or female checkboxes. They didn't really serve a purpose, but they are trying, in some ways, to get away from the binary conceptualization of gender. Psychometric testing is minimally suggested uh, with level two instruments. So if you go to, <clears throat> in the DSM, in section three, where they have the level one and two cross-cutting measures, they also have a table that talks about if this person meets this criteria on level one, then this is the level two measure that you would use. So it does give you a little bit of guidance about where to go, but again, it's not going to talk about things like the Beck Depression Inventory or some of those others that you learned about in graduate school. Scoring of the World Health Organization Disability Assessment Schedule, or the HUDAS, 
was clarified. And there's not <clears throat> a whole lot of information on this. Not a lot of us use the HUDAS, but it can be very useful if you're doing um, a short-term disability or a long-term disability assessment on somebody or working with somebody who is on short-term, especially on short-term disability, in order to um, quantify the degree of disability that the person is experiencing as a result of their current condition. Persistent complex bereavement disorder was moved out of Section 3, Conditions for Further Study, and into trauma and stressor-related disorders. Now, I know that there is a lot, there are a lot of strong feelings about this particular disorder. Um, it is in the DSM-5 TR. Whether you agree that it should be or not, uh, it is what it is. And there is a section on the American Psychiatric Association website where uh, you can submit suggestions for revisions to the DSM-5 TR, which ostensibly will go into the DSM-6 whenever that comes out. So if you have strong feelings about it, um, submitting a request for changes can be made there. And we will be talking about next week, persistent complex bereavement disorder. The cultural formulation interview added to the definition of culture, the cultural background of the healthcare providers and the values and assumptions embedded in the organization and practices of healthcare systems and institutions may affect the clinical interaction. So it's emphasizing where it didn't specifically talk about this before, it's emphasizing and reminding us to consider the impact that our culture has on the people we serve, as well as our organization and what our organization represents. For a lot of people, community behavioral health organizations, for example, may represent the system. So what does that mean to them? What does going to a therapist mean to them? The, additionally, under the um, clinical formula uh, cultural formulation interview, it added that the CFI may help clarify or identify divergent views of symptoms or expectations of care based on previous experience with other cultural systems of healing and health care. So other cultures may approach treatment of depression or anxiety or other mental disorders in a different way. And the CFI helps us bring out um, people's beliefs about what might be effective in treating their pre presenting symptoms and maybe what have caused it. Potential mistrust of mainstream services and institutions by individuals with collective histories of trauma and oppression. Um, this is also um, indicated or assessed in the cultural formulation interview. So we can start gaining some understanding about how, how trauma and oppression are impacting our, the presentation of our client, how they're presenting to us, whether they're presenting to us, and what might be needed in order to establish rapport. Cultural concepts of distress describe ways individuals report and understand experiences of illness, including idioms. And I thought it was interesting. One of the idioms they actually gave was burnout. And we've heard a lot over the, in recent um, weeks, months about burnout. And it's important to understand that Burnout's really, it's not a diagnosis in the DSM. So when somebody says, I'm experiencing burnout, that can mean a lot of different things. So we need to ask them more specifically, what does that look like for you? Um, perceived causes and culture related syndromes um, are updated throughout the text. So if there are certain um, 
issues that might be more uh, prevalent in one culture over another those are um, noted understanding cultural concepts of distress enhances identification of individuals concerns and detection of psychopathology some cultures tend to somaticize their symptoms more than they talk about emotion so they talk more about their low energy and their pain and their lethargy it's important to recognize that it's important to recognize each culture's concept of mental illness even my grandmother for example uh, she came from a time when you didn't talk to other people about your stuff it was shameful to go to counseling so understanding what it was like growing up in back in the 1920s and 30s is really important to understand the client that if you're working with a client from that from that time accurate diagnosis can also be enhanced using cultural concepts of distress collection of useful clinical information can be gathered by understanding particular idioms that people use like if somebody says to me I'm burned out um, I have an idea what that means I have an idea that we're looking at um, a, a depression with anxiety features going with it or maybe just straight depression so that gives me a little bit more to talk about or a, a little bit of a direction for questions that I might ask in a semi-structured interview rapport and engagement um, are enhanced with by understanding cultural concepts of distress because we can speak the patient's language if they're saying burnout you say burnout you don't need to correct them and go well that's really actually persistent depressive disorder or whatever if they're calling it burnout that's what they have brought you that's what we're going to work with uh, therapeutic effectiveness can be enhanced because we start to understand all of the factors that are contributing to this person's presenting symptoms what they believe is causing those issues and what they believe might help them and we know from research that a lot of information um or, or a lot of our effectiveness is less from the techniques we use and more from our rapport so if we're working with something that the person believes to be true then they're probably going to be more motivated to implement it and they're probably going to experience and, and not saying that they will but the chance that they'll experience a more robust treatment effect is there understanding cultural concepts of distress also enhances what I call the trajectory of clinical research it helps us figure out what do we need to study so since burnout came up all of a sudden there's been an explosion of studies on burnout uh, as people start to embrace things and use these idioms or present with these issues then we start I hate to say validating them but that's kind of what happens we start saying oh maybe there's something to this and research starts to expand and cultural concepts of distress can also clarify cultural epidemiology that is what disorders tend to be more prevalent in which cultures and then we can start looking at why is that and what confounds exist remember culture is not just race or ethnicity or, or those things it can be very granular so based on a person's ethnicity their geography their socioeconomic status their you know we can go on they may have a very different experience and a very different culture than somebody you know somewhere else so somebody who lives in Miami has a very different cultural outlook about a lot of things often than people who live where I do which is a very rural town you know about 30 miles outside of Nashville very different cultures 
The cultural for formulation interview gathers basic information that will help the clinician integrate culture and social context into the diagnosis. And it's not a long um, interview. I would encourage you to integrate it into your assessment process. It takes like maybe 10 more minutes. Other conditions that may be the focus of clinical attention are included to be responsive to all concerns identified by the CFI. So it helps us get a more um, comprehensive look at the biopsychosocial picture of what's going on with this person. In terms of culture and racism, the term racialized is used instead of race or racial to highlight the socially constructed nature of race. The term ethno-racial is used throughout the text and denotes groups that combine ethnic and racialized identifiers. Additionally, the words minority and non-white are removed because they describe social groups in relation to a racialized majority and perpetuate social hi hierarchies. The word Latinx Latinx replaces Latino or Latina to be gender inclusive. However, just a side note, according to a Pew Research poll in 2002, just 4% of people say they prefer Latinx to describe the Hispanic or Latino population. The majority of people responding said they preferred the term Hispanic. So it is important to ask the person, not just assume that because this is the term used in the DSM, this is the term that your, the people you serve will, will prefer. So make sure to ask. Cultural norms that may impact degree of perceived pathology are reported. Um, some people will, if they're only having minor symptoms, they will minimize, deny, you know, suppress it. Uh, because that's the cultural norm. The cultural norm is to suck it up, buttercup, so to speak. And it's important to understand uh, what that might mean. So somebody who is presenting in your office may minimize their symptoms because they don't want to seem crazy. And, and so we need to understand the cultural norms around... Um, their presentation as well as what they what they perceive as pathological. Remember in the DSM it says causes clinically significant distress. Well, to whom? Uh, we, we need to understand what they consider problematic. Now, if they're in our office, probably if they're voluntary, they consider what's going on problematic. The risk for misdiagnosis when evaluating people from oppressed or ethno-racial groups is also noted. So in several of the diag diagnostic um, entries, it does talk about issues that might lead someone to misdiagnose one thing for another. For example, with ADHD, uh, based on a person's ethno-racial presentation, uh, some people are over-diagnosed with conduct disorder versus ADHD um, when, they, when they may actually have ADHD. It's just assumed to be conduct disorder. So it emphasizes the need, again, for us as clinicians to look back at our own personal assumptions. So the good, the bad, and the ugly. Good. The DSM-5-TR is somewhat more user-friendly. Instead of using the term executive functioning, it actually gives examples of the behaviors that you're looking for. It did add a section regarding suicide risk. And I, like I said, I think that is helpful. In my opinion, bad. The data is more than six years old. The ICD-11 is out and very different from the ICD-10. And I haven't found information about exactly when Full adoption of the ICD-11 will take place, but it's out there and it started being adopted in, in January of this year. Now the link here takes you to the ICD website where you can search. So 
you have a DSM-5, DSM-5-TR, you need the IC, ICD code, you can go to the website, you just type in the nomenclature, you know, major depressive disorder, and it will bring up the ICD-10, uh, ICD-11 codes for you. I'm frustrated personally that it does not include differential diagnosis from medical conditions that could cause similar symptoms. So, you know, you have, for example, depression, um, depressive disorder caused by a medical condition. Well, if you don't know that hypothyroid can cause symptoms of depression, then, or, um, certain type vitamin D deficiency or anemia, or there's a whole bunch of things that can cause symptoms of depression, then you might not know that that's a more accurate diagnosis. So it would be helpful. Um, and I'm hoping in the six, they will do a better job of identifying, you know, what physiological issues do we need to rule out? Because a lot of our people have not had a phys full physical in years. It, it's rare for me to be working with somebody who says, oh yeah, you know, I get my, my physical annually. Yeah, not so much. Uh, it still uses binary gender constructs in the gender related diagnostic issues section. So in order to get away from the binary constructs, they remove the check boxes on the self-assessment self measures but then they left the binary constructs all the way through the rest of the text. So I was a little frustrated about that. Sometimes it gives measure, measurable facts like 75% of patients or 50% of the time. <clears throat> I like quantification. Uh, it helps me, you know, understand things a little bit better. Other times it uses terms like frequently, often, rarely. I'm like, well, what does that mean? Does that mean 15%, 1%, 0. 0.00001%? What does rarely mean? It never gives data on what studies were used to arrive at the conclusions. It will just say, studies have said. So it feels like, well, just trust us, wink, wink. Um, for example, in the ADHD diagnostic section, uh, it has a, a line in there, ADHD predicted persistence of suicidal thoughts in U.S. Army soldiers. Okay, what other confounds were looked at? Um, when was this done? Uh, you know, what was the sample size? Give me a little bit more to go with. Um, with all of the focus on adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, over the past five, maybe 10 years, they're not even mentioned once in the text. And that is distrustful to me. In my humble opinion, and I know I already said this is opinion, but I'm making sure you know it's, you know, these are my opinions. Pathologizing grief that does not remit in one year for adults or six months for children is problematic. You know, um, I've worked with grief for many, many years, and not everybody goes through the grieving process at the same rate. And there's complex grief when there's been, you know, when a, when a child dies, for example, that very often takes more than a year for the person to substantially move on, my opinion. In conditions for further study, internet gaming disorder is still relegated back to conditions for further study. Neurobehavioral disorder associated with prenatal alcohol exposure, still in conditions for further study. There are hundreds, no joke, hundreds of research studies and there's even um, government funded foundations that are researching, diagnosing, and treating fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And, but for some reason, it's still not making it into the front end of the DSM. So that's another thing that's, that's a little bit frustrating because we know and there's clear research, clear evidence that FASDs do exist. And as many of you have commented prior to this, 
Um, I will echo uh, complex PTSD or CPTSD isn't even included. It didn't even make conditions for further study. There is research on it. If you go to PubMed, there is research on it. Um, and there is a some research that has indicated that it is a distinct entity, distinct from both um, borderline personality as well as PTSD. But, um, yeah. So, that's not in there. The ugly. Unlike the change from the DSM-4 uh, TR to the DSM-5, the changes from the 5 to the 5 TR are somewhat inconsequential to the actual diagnosis, although it provides a more robust biopsychosocial picture. And that's, again, my opinion, because in the majority of cases, except for the handful that I mentioned earlier in this presentation, the diagnostic criteria didn't change. Our understanding of the diagnosis or confounds may have changed, but the diagnosis itself, uh, diagnostic criteria itself did not change. And at a $200 price tag, it's an expensive book. There are still no sections indicating psychometric testing, except for those cross-cutting measures. I would love to see that at the end of each diagnosis. You know, what tests, how can we assess for this? What tests are out there? Would be nice to have that in there, but it's not. There is still no um, mention of evidence-based practices. And that would be another thing that would be nice to be in there. So what do you do to address this? If you go to the American Psychiatric Association um, treatment guidelines for psychiatrists, they have very clear treatment guidelines about best practices. Um, and, and I would like to, even if they're not included in the DSM-6, it would be nice if they at least had a link to it uh, so people could find it. You know, what are the current best practices for dissociative disorder? What, you know, what do we know? And as I mentioned before a couple of times, medical differential diagnosis, except for due to another medical condition, uh, is really still not available. So it's up to the clinician to understand and really evaluate the um, onset of the illness and try to figure out, is there some underlying medical issue? The diagnostic criteria for more than 99% of the disorders remained exactly the same from the DSM-5. And when I say diagnostic criteria, what I'm talking about is that box at the beginning of every diagnosis that says the patient needs to meet three out of the following five criteria or whatever. So that checkbox is what I call it. Um, everything after that changed. The DSM-5 TR uses somewhat more user-friendly language. It's crucial to read the entire text for the diagnosis to identify all of the possible confounds and treatment issues because stuff got moved around and confounding conditions or differential things that could be differentially diagnosed appear in multiple different sections. So it's important, read the whole thing. Um, the DSM-5 TR provides additional information for consideration to improve diagnosis and treatment including consideration of cultural biases. So again, it does provide more, more well-rounded uh, biopsychosocial information. I hope this was helpful to you, and I hope it allayed some of your fears maybe about what is coming in the new DSM-5 TR because I, I know a lot of my students are taking diagnosis this semester and they're like, we just learned the DSM-5. Calm down, breathe. You got this. Um, and I hope you're as excited as I am about it, that they are, they have cons done some updating. They are adding some more useful sections and they are starting to consider or at least make more prominent, maybe they always considered it, make more prominent the uh, fact that general medical conditions can 
contribute to it. So anyhow, thank you for being with me. And next week, we're going to go on to the more fun part, I guess you can say. And we will be talking about depressive disorders and the um, prolonged grief disorder that are in the new DSM-5 and everything you need to know about that. I will do a follow-on video after that that talks about interventions. So each week on Wednesday, we are going to talk about the diagnostic criteria only. And then there will be another video, hopefully on Friday of that week, that talks about um, biopsychosocial interventions that are currently identified as best practices. Have a great day.